mate. When when did you first stumble across this lake, and and how did you how did you come about to to run in it the way you have, and what made you run it the way you have? God, right. So Ashmead um, has always been part of my fishing life, really, for almost as long as I can remember. I first came down here as a teenager uh, when it was owned by uh, a local chap called Tom Squires, and Tom ran it as a duck shoot. And uh, my mum was the local midwife and she used to look after Tom and uh, he knew I was interested in angling and he invited me to come down and fish. Um, so I would have been, I don't know, 15, 16 years old then I suppose, something like that when I first came down here, late 70s uh, and through into the early 80s. And back then um, Tom's Pond, which is named after Tom, was the hot spot on the lake and Tom would let me fish there but nobody else. Um, so that was really exciting as a teenager and you'd come down and you'd find these double figure uh, mirror and common carp which were the biggest fish I'd seen in my life swimming around in this fantastic wetland. Um, and I was hooked and I, Ashmead has been part of my life ever since then really. Ashmead was very neglected, it was uh, very badly silted up most of the lake um, and, uh, but the original fish were still in here. Um, and it had huge potential um, and I could see that and Steve could see it. So, um, so we bought it and we put into, pla into place a, a restoration plan which essentially, well at that time Ashmead consisted really of Goat Willow which was a three acre lake that Steve Maynard had created in the middle of the wetland. Um, and what we did was restore all of the rest of the 17 acres of wetland and then connected Goat Willow back into it and let the fish spread and grow and do their own thing. So, um, gosh, that's now, when was that? 2005, so a long time ago now. Um, so when I was that you know, wide-eyed teenager, I never thought I would end up owning the place. Um, and I'm delighted, obviously, and thrilled that I have. But I don't think of myself as an owner here. I think of myself as a custodian, really. So for me, it's about looking after Ashmead, looking after it for future generations and handing it on to future generations in uh, pretty good shape so that other 13 year old kids can get as excited about the fishing down here as I did. My take on it all is that we have some fantastic carp fisheries in this country and we have fantastic carp in this country so we don't need to import carp anymore. We have good stocks of our own in fisheries and on fish farms, you have the likes of Viv Shears and, and others, you know, Simon Scott producing these fantastic carp. But if you want to start from scratch and stock a fishery, you can stock with those, you can grow them on, and you can end up with a wonderful carp which has been proven. And it's a, you know, that there is no need anymore to look overseas for large fish to bring in to create instant carp fisheries. And when bringing in those fish from overseas brings with it the risk of disease. So effectively you're playing Russian roulette, not only with your own carp stocks, but actually with those of neighboring fisheries up and down the country. You know, I'm very, very much against that. Um, the whole sort of keep it real side of things, you know, I'm less comfortable with. I don't like and have never liked sort of the judgmental side of carp fishing, sort of my fish is better than yours. And I try and steer clear of that. Um, as I say, what interests me is long-term sustainable fishery management, keeping carp fisheries in this country healthy so they can be there for future generations of anglers to enjoy, and that's where my focus is. So do you feel um, there have been some fundamental mistakes in our UK fishing, and if so, when would you say um, this started to occur? Obviously we had the imports coming in hard and fast in the 80s, but would you say there was a, a turning curve a bit of a particular time? Um, I, I don't know, I, I suppose the 80s are when you know the, the, the problem really started to, to, to rear its head if you like. Uh, there are some recent examples of what I would consider myself to be very poor fishery management, of fish being stopped at a very very large weight into water simply for publicity purposes um, and they're fish that have no relationship with that water. You know I might as well bring a, an 80 pound carp in and put it in my bathtub for all the, the, the sort of um, the meaning that those, that sort of situation has, in my view. Um, but you know, the other side of the coin is there's also a backlash against those sorts of fisheries and the anglers who fish them from some of the, the carp angling fraternity. And I find that equally, in a way, distasteful. You know, um, there was the case of the fish called Big Rig recently, which was stocked into a water at a large size. Um, it was then, by no fault of his own, caught by an angler who appears to be a really nice, genuine guy, and the backlash against him on um, social media, I found you know, just as 
distasteful as the sort of the fishery management that um, lay behind that situation as well. So I, I just wish that people would just stop and think um, and take a long-term view and try not to be judgmental. I try not to. Um, I just quietly do my own thing and manage my fishery in the way that I think you know is, is um, has some meaning, if you like, and that's sustainable and is doing nobody else any harm um, and gives me and the anglers who fish here a lot of pleasure. So having walked the banks now for two years running at five days at a time, you can't help but just fall in love with this place. I've had larger fish across the UK, far larger in the continent, but I had one fish out of here last year uh, and I believe that to be my fish of a lifetime for so many different reasons which I've written up previously. But um, why do you feel this is so special and, and it being so special, so difficult to get onto? A uh, really good friend of mine, Dickie Turpin, who, who was a long-standing uh, angler down here in the old syndicate days, said about Ashmead, he said, you either get it or you don't, and that's true. And we're very, very lucky that we have um, a group of anglers now who really get it, who really love the fishing down here. Um, so Ashmead is, is 17 acres of wetland. It's uh, a very intimate water, although it is 17 acres of um, well, the whole wetland is 17 acres, about 13 acres of water here. Um, but the longest cast is probably 25, 30 yards. Most of my fishing here, which I do in the winter, is you know, I'm catching fish within six inches of the bank all the time. That's where they like to be. So it's challenging fishing, it's tricky, intimate fishing. Um, we only ever have seven anglers here at a time. So with 33 swims and all of the stalking bays and channels that we've got, you know, that's four and just under four miles of bank that you can fish. You know, you can lose yourself. You can you can come down here and see no one for five days if you want to, um, or you can be you know be more sociable than that if you're so inclined. But the point is that it, it's very much you against the fish. It's not you against other anglers, um, and that sort of freedom to fish for carp that are as close to wild as you can get is uh, something that people really value and particularly when the fish are you know some of them are incredibly large I mean 50, 50 pound plus um, number of, is, is the biggest mirror she's been up to 58 and a half um, we've got commons over 40 um, and a lot of 30 pound 20 pound fish um, and so to come across those fish at close quarters in this sort of rich environment is just hugely exciting. You know, you never know when you walk around the next corner and look at the next little bay what you're going to find there. And people love that. You've got in this particular venue here uh, an abundance of, of weed that just keeps growing and it's just left to grow. In any commercial fishery, the main would see that as problematic. I mean, I, I love it. I, I find them glowing spots, and uh, if anything, that's given me more of a clue of where to start on such a labyrinth of water. Um, but um, what's, what's the upside of that for you, Mark? And, and, and what's behind your thinking of how you're managing that with its, its natural flair? Well, again, it all comes back to the nature of the fishery and the ecology of the fishery. So I've always believed um, that you know, the best way of managing a sustainable fishery, which will naturally grow healthy fish reflecting their environment, is to keep a really rich um, environment to allow a natural ecosystem and ecology to develop on the back of that, um, which will then be a stable system. And, and you know, I'm a great believer that nature has been managing fisheries um, you know, without our help and despite our interference for millions of years. So, you know, who am I to think I can do better? Um, so we actually keep the carp numbers down in here. So the only carp fishery management I do is to crop and remove carp from Ashby to keep the numbers down. And that means that the large fish are continuing to grow. They're staying healthy. The small fish coming through, um, through natural spawning each year, um, those that we leave in the fishery will perform really well and are growing really well. Um, but also because we're on clay here, you know, if you had too many carp, they would stir up the bottom. Um, the water would be the colour of, you know, it'd be like cappuccino, the weed wouldn't grow. And that's when you then get into a situation where you can have algal blooms and you can risk losing all of your stock overnight. 
So the weed is producing a stable environment, it's producing the oxygen for the fish. So even in the hot summer we've had this year, we haven't actually, you know, touch wood, lost any carp at all from the fishery. Um, so it's a healthy environment from that point of view. The weed provides cover. The wheat is where all of the carp's food is, is. so whether they're feeding on you know, gamma shrimp, whether they're feeding on rud fry, whatever they might want, the, the weed is sort of part of the structure that allows all of that, um, the food web to develop and to be sustained as well. So it's just a healthy thing to have and it does make it really challenging fishing. You have to have the confidence to fish into weed um, and uh, I, I, I guess you know that's something either you, you have or you don't have as an angler. Um, so you know most the anglers who come down here I don't think I've ever had a complaint that it's too weedy even though at times some of the swims look like they're, they're sort of the lawn in my back garden or you know one of the fields. I can't tell where the lake ends and the field begins but uh, you know it is what it is and uh, if you if you like that challenge if you like that rich environment you know Ashfield is, is, is the place that delivers I think it's fair to say and very clear and easy to see your passion for Ashmead and all things natural surrounding it. Um, where, does, where does it all come from though, Scaf? What's, what's your background? What makes you who you are and to think the way you do about environments such as this? I've been an angler since I was six years old and it's always gripped me throughout my life. Um, and through angling, I developed a, a passion for being out in the countryside, for being in touch with nature. And that um, instilled in me the, the sort of the, just the thrill of, of, of being out in the countryside and led me into nature conservation as a, as a degree and as a career. Um, and so I, I did a degree in marine biology originally and specialised in freshwater fisheries work and I started off my career working in Scotland with the salmon farming industry and on salmon river restoration. Uh, I then worked as a fishery scientist with the National Rivers Authority as it was in the northwest, um, doing research on salmon populations on some of the, the best salmon rivers in the country and also looking at environments sort of down on the north bank of the Mersey where they were very, very polluted and had to be brought back to life. So that was thrilling. Um, I retrained as a rural surveyor and I then started working for the National Trust and I worked for the National Trust for 15 years, ending up as Head of Rural Surveying. So working with landscapes and with nature conservation on a very large scale and the Trust strap line forever for everyone and that really struck home with me that we ought to be managing our landscapes and fisheries like this with a very, very long term view over generations, not just from one year to the next. Um, and so 15 years with the, with the National Trust um, it gave me a huge exposure and an experience in nature conservation. And it's lovely now that we own Ashmead that I can take, sort of almost go full circle if you like. And so all of that professional work I've done through my life in fisheries, in nature conservation, is now being reinvested back in the 17 acres of Somerset wetland where it all started. And I now get a great deal of pleasure from um, working with Ashmead, developing it, having restored it, thinking to the future, things like planting little oak trees which, you know, I'll never see mature, but which I know future generations will sit in the shade of or possibly climb up to spot fish. I, I, I just love all of that. Um, so I, I am incredibly passionate about it and uh, I'm very, very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. So we see loads and loads and loads of absolute stunning corkers that reside here in Ashmead Park. Um, talk us through some of the sizes of some of your favourites and why they're your favourites. Right, interestingly the, the, the bigger fish aren't my favourites. Um, most people know of single scale, um, which is the biggest mirror in here. Um, single scale's been up to 58 and a half pounds. She's still quite a young fish, about 25 years old I think, uh, and still growing. Um, but you know, she's a stunning carp, don't get me wrong. I mean, really long, lean, lots of, apart from the big scales that um, she's known for, there are lots of little starburst scales on her. She's a good looking fish. Um, but there are, to my mind, nicer fish in here. Um, so my favorite, I guess, I can't have a favorite. There are so many good fish. Um, the big commons, I've always been a fan of big commons. And uh, ever, ever since I was a kid fishing for carp, common carp were the ones I wanted to catch. 
and my favourites in here would be um, the Long Common and a carp called JC, which is um, sort of a mid 40 pound common. Um, and they are just incredible looking fish. You know, very, very long, lean carp. Um, long common is quite a young fish, younger than single scale, maybe 20, 22 years old, something like that. Um, JC is one of, I think, one of the survivors of the original stocking from Tommy Squire, so not bred in there in the wetland like um, single scale and long common arshies I think was, was introduced as a fingerling um, and maybe as old as uh, well, 71 so what's that make her 46, 47 years old maybe um, but just an amazing looking carp. Um, the thing about JC is that she doesn't fight at all and will give you an incredibly subtle take so you'll get one bleep um, and you might see the rod tip quivering and that quite often will be it with JC. And then if you do reel into her uh, or hook her, you'll quite often she'll come in just like a like a dead bream and you don't realise what you have on the end until all of a sudden this common that's well over three and a half feet long appears. And that's where her name comes from because everyone just goes, Jesus Christ, look at that, <laughs> as she slips over the neck cord. But uh, just a fantastic fish. And then we've got sort of the second, well, there's another original in here, which is my my, my sort of uh, nemesis, if you like, I think every lake, uh, every angler has a, a fish they would love to catch that they can't catch. And for me, there's a fish in here called the grey, which is a, a mid-30 mirror. Um, slate grey, as its name suggests, and half linear scaling, and a fantastic craggy old carp. Certainly one of the original fingerlings in, introduced by Tommy Squires, um, so you know, well over 40 years old. And the grey and I have grown up together um, down here at Ashmead. Uh, and throughout my fishing life down here, I still cannot catch that fish, and I don't think now I ever will. I think it's always going to be my, my, my sort of bony fish. Uh, I'd love to catch it one day. It's the most amazing looking old carp. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that would be up there probably as my favourite mirror in here. There's a whole mix though. There are some fully scale fish. There's a large fully scale fish called Patch, which is absolutely stunning. Um, we've got a very big linear carp in here that I'd love to see on the bank. That, last came out seven years ago at um, 29 and a half pounds and hasn't been caught since although it was hooked and lost by a friend of mine Keith, Keith Wheeler um, he was out in the boat with Mike Kavanagh playing it for about half an hour and uh, he had it over the net and Mike was just about to lift the net around it when it dropped off um, so that's still in here and I think is, is very big now that will be interesting next time it's landed um, and then there are the young fish growing through like the one that you, you've caught yourself. So that's a carp that I caught at two and a half pound in weight the first time it was caught in 2015, so only three years ago. Um, and I guess it was 15, 12 you had it at? 15, 12, yeah. 15, 12. So stunning. stunning. And, I, and I get stunning. more excited about those small fish growing through than I do some of the big ones when they're landed because those are the future of Ashby. Yeah. You know, when I'm pushing up the daisies or sat in a rocking chair on the on the porch of the Ashmead hut, unable to fish anymore, you know, people will be talking about those little fish in the same way that, you know, other anglers today are talking about single yeah. scale and some of those big comments. Yeah. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's, that's what Ashmead's all about for me. It's that sort of long-term fishery management. For me, you know, I think back to when I was a kid starting carp fishing and I was catching fish on a rod with a line and a hook and a floating crust. It was simple and the pleasure that that gave me um, hasn't changed and I'll, I'll show you the tackle I've caught most of my big fish on this summer uh, in a minute. I'll go and get that out of the Land Rover and show you. Actually, it's the same tackle I was using back then. You don't need complicated rigs. You certainly don't need bivvies the size of a bus with wardrobes and tables and all of that sort of stuff overly priced you know imported from China and then prices through the roof and, and why don't you need it well partly just just personally it detracts from angling it, you know angling is not about being complicated and technical and all that kind of stuff there's a place for a bit of that but angling actually is about getting out in the countryside that's what my fishing is about to me but more importantly now, I'm, I'm a dad, um, I have two sons who are interested in fishing and particularly my youngster Alistair who's 15 and I see a lot of tackle um, and a lot of the complication in angling, the fact that you've got to have three identical rods and hugely expensive reels and rods and all of this paraphernalia is a barrier to young kids getting into the sport. And, and that, that breaks my heart, you know, and I, 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 I do wonder where the next generation of anglers are coming from if the message that the industry is putting out is that you can't start carp fishing unless you've got sort of six or seven thousand pounds to burn. 
Um, you know, I didn't have that when I was a kid. My kids don't have that. And as a parent, I can't afford to set my kids up with that kind of, of tackle. So, you know, any company that's producing really good quality kit at a really good price, you know, I would support. Um, and I wouldn't condemn any part of the industry. Every company, I think, has some products that are really good and really useful. Um, but there's certainly an element now in car fishing where, um, you know, things are overpriced. Uh, and unnecessarily so in my view. There's also a huge amount of tackle that actually is of, of no value at all other than in making anglers comfortable on the bank or whatever. It certainly doesn't help you really catch fish uh, and gimmickry and sort of one-upmanship and all that kind of thing. Um, and I, I just, you know, I, I like what you're doing with cherry carp with the terminal tackle for example. You know, the hooks I've, I've been using of yours, the line, the hook links and so on I've used of yours are as good as anything out there on the market at a fraction of the price and uh, you know if you could afford to do that and still run a company and make a profit at a price that my kids can afford why can't other companies it's as simple as that really thank you again and look forward to seeing you next year but no doubt we'll be talking in between well thanks for your continuing support tarby of the fishery uh, coming here as, as a guest it's a pleasure to have you here and i, I just enjoy your company it's been great vice versa we'll leave the outtakes <laughs> <laughs> cheers mate